Okay, so I think I'm going to go ahead and give you a more in-depth texturing tutorial. You can uh, watch and kind of learn how to do stuff inside of Gaia regarding texturing. I already made a video on this uh, recently, but it was a very basic introductory one, so I'm going to go ahead and do a more in-depth one here for you. So I'm going to go ahead and keep the defaults that we have here, but I'm going to remove the erosion node. So <clears throat> um, let's go ahead and just keep mountain here. And we're going to just change the seat around until we find something a little bit more detailed than that. I just need it to be a little bit higher. And if it takes too long to find a seed that we like, then I will... That could work. That's really tall, but it's not very wide. We could probably... This will probably do. Yeah, I think this will do. So we have some interesting features here. Lots of warping going on. Uh, we can change these around, but I think I'll just keep these. Now, the reason why we have a di this, the displace node here is uh, a couple of reasons. One, because that was default. That was just on there when we started. But another one is, is because a lot of the nodes that we use that are the primitive nodes, they actually have these really cool features, but a lot of them aren't really natural to begin with. We have to kind of process these primitives to give us what we need and to make them more interesting. And the displace node's really good at doing that because it adds just a bit of displacement to the overall uh, fractal that's making this uh, this uh, shape. And if we do the 2D view, as you see here, that's what we're getting. That's what we're getting without it, the displace, and this is what we're getting with the displace. Now it's not very much because we don't really have a whole lot of different, you know, settings here that we're using. So uh, let's go ahead and kind of ramp it up a bit. So instead of using the standard method, I'm going to use the rugged method. And the rugged kind of pinches and squeezes things together and uh, really breaks up the shapes from the original fractal. That looks pretty good. Uh, we also have the strength, scale, complexity, things like that, and this high quality checkbox, which I like to check because it, it adds in a lot of extra details and uh, changes it around quite a bit more without having to change these too much and uh, I think this will be good for now because we're going to be adding a lot more stuff to it so now that we have these two let's go ahead and add breaker and like I said <coughs> or hopefully I said anyways we are just making our first landscape here that we're going to be texturing but we, you know, obviously we need a landscape to texture so that's what we're doing right now so Breaker is awesome because we can uh, use it to add these big cracks to our landscape. And if you've watched any of my other videos, you know how much I really like Breaker. And I only really do two things. I use hard cracks and I use accurate cracks. The reason for that is because I want them to be as accurate as possible. And if I check hard cracks, then I don't have to change these options all that much. But here's the thing with Breaker. I keep popping my jaw. I need to stop doing that. If... Uh, if we were to change the resolution from 0.5k to 1k and let that build out, you'll notice, keep an eye on the cracks, you'll notice that they get a lot more interesting. They get a lot more uh, sharp. And that's cool and all, but um, when we build this out at higher resolutions, we don't want it to kind of destroy our uh, landscape and then we have to backtrack and then rebuild everything out. So what I recommend doing is go to at least 2K when you get to the breaker part or the breaker erosion. The reason being is because you're only three nodes in and it's not going to take very long to build out all three of these nodes um, if your computer is, you know, half decent. And then when you get to 2K, if you're looking at how the cracks look in 2K and if they are passable at 2K, chances are they might be passable at 4K. But if you see any features here at 2K that you don't want 
or that if they're too sharp and they take up a lot more of the landscape than you would like, rein in some of these or some of these settings. For instance, maybe if we didn't like how deep these cracks right here are, like right here, we can change the depth. If we didn't like how much their the total erosion amount is happening, we can take the erosion power down. If we wanted them to take up more of the landscape but not necessarily um, carve into it too much, we can increase the duration, maybe lower the erosion power in the depth and the river length. It just really depends on what you want. But this is just a kind of like a like a guideline. You don't necessarily have to do this. And the reason why I say this is because I had built up an entire node graph of like 60 nodes, found out that the breaker node completely destroyed my scene when I built it out at uh, 4K. And I found that the difference between 2K and 4K with breaker is uh, it's noticeable, but it's negligible, I suppose, in the way that you can just, you can go to 4K and you'll notice that there's a slight difference, but you can usually work around that, um, and it's not too bad. But anyways, without getting out too much on that, let's go back to 5K, and I'll jump back maybe to 1 or 2K at the end of the video so we can see the overall nature of our landscape, but I'm going to keep it at 0.5K for now just to uh, keep things moving along. So, anyways... Breaker looked good at 2K. Um, I liked the way it looked with these basic settings. So let's keep going. Another erosion that I really like is uh, fold. And I like to add fold after I add my erosion. When you add breaker and erosion together like this, what ends up happening is you'll fill in those cracks that we made with the sedimentation from the erosion. And that's cool, that's what kind of like what we want, but we don't want it to fill in so much that we lose the cracks. So if we look at it right here, we have these cracks that are more interesting, but the erosion kind of, they're still there, but the erosion fills them in quite a bit. So you can do a couple things. You can turn the overall strength down, or you can increase the or decrease the rock softness so that the rocks get a little bit harder. But what I like to do is I just like to take down the duration by one or two steps, or even maybe three, depending on what I need. And what that does is it still gives us the erosion power we need, but it doesn't fill in the cracks as much. So this is without the erosion, and this is with the erosion. And you can see how it's breaking up our entire landscape like this with the erosion the way we want it to while filling in the cracks, but keeping them at the same time. So next is fold, and you'll notice when we attach fold, we will kind of change our landscape completely. We'll start getting these um, folded sides on our landscape, depending on what angle we're wanting to uh, change it at. And I usually like to default anywhere between 45 and 50, just because that's a really good angle. And you can see right here what it's doing. And fold just gives us these like vertical folds in the landscape which is nice, and if you've watched any of my other videos, you'll notice, you'll know that Fold is also one of my all-time favorite erosions to, to use. And uh, what we'll do here for this instance is we're gonna take the angle completely down, and we're just gonna play around with some of these other um, settings, like range. And range is the range of the folding on the overall landscape. So if you decrease the range, you'll notice that it's we're still getting the folding, but we've lost a lot of the other interesting features in our landscape. If we increase the range, if too much anyways, oh, that was the angle, sorry. If we increase the range, we get a lot of our uh, original landscape back, but we lose some of the folding attributes that we like. So if you go somewhere between 50, you'll start noticing where they come in, but if you go lower than 50, like usually around in the 25% range, that's 25 to 30 is about usually where I play around with it because you get a lot of your original shape back, but you also get the folding like right here and over here. That's pretty good. Uh, the scale, obviously, uh, like many of these nodes, scales just affects the scale, the overall effect. Um, folding is the amount of folding that you want to occur on the landscape. If you increase it, it starts folding it a little bit more um, and breaking it apart. The rift 
is interesting because what that'll do is, as you can see here, we still have that folding effect, but it's added a lot of kind of noise and other features in here that break up the overall landscape, which looks really cool if it's tamed. That is way too much, in my opinion. So if we were to go back down to like right here, where we have more of our original landscape, if we add just a tad bit of rift, we'll break up the original landscape and folding just a tad bit, and we'll get more interesting rocky shapes. And they'll be a little bit more hard looking, which is what I'm going for. So I think this looks good for now. We're going to add another erosion node. And in this erosion node, um, I don't want to totally eradicate the folding that we had going on here. So we're just going to take the erosion that we have right here, and we're just going to decrease it by two steps in the duration. That way, we break apart the overall uh, fold design, but keep the folding look, like right here. It doesn't eradicate it. All right, so I think that looks good. And this is just a very basic landscape. This isn't anything too special. Um, it is an interesting shape overall, but it'll just serve its purpose for texturing here. Okay, so that's our landscape. Now we need to focus on texturing. So one of the things I like to do when I'm texturing is throw out a portal, throw out another portal and drop it right on top of this one. And what that'll do is it'll link this portal to this portal. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take the output of the erosion and plug it into that portal. And what that's going to allow us to do is any time that we have a node, specifically let's say, let's put this portal down here where we're going to put our texturing nodes. Say we, we, we had um, like a texture node right here connected to this portal right here. What that's going to do is it's going to assign the texture to this erosion node, as you can see here. So anytime that we connect anything to this portal, it's going to be connecting the to the output of this node. But the nice thing about that is now I can move this portal anywhere I want, and I don't have all these lines that are connected and getting in the way. It just keeps things really nice and clean. And I really like the portals. It was one of my most favorite features when it was introduced, and it will probably remain my favorite feature for as long as Gaia exists, because things get extremely messy. Okay, so we have this texture. We need another texture. And we're just gonna connect that to the same portal. So now we have these two textures and we need to have a couple other things here. So this portal right here is the output for this erosion. We're gonna make another portal. And we're gonna connect that portal to there. And I'm just gonna space these apart like that. And what I'm going to do is we're going to take a slope selection, connect that to here, connect that to the portal. There we go. And now let's just clean this up a bit, make it look nice. That'll happen every once in a while, especially when I'm playing around with a bunch of different nodes that have to connect to something and it decides to want to crash. I might not make this side look pretty if that's how it's going to behave. <laughs> Sometimes it does that. All right, so doing the lasso selection or the rectangle selection or whatever seems to want to work. All right, there we go. I just want them to be nice and clean so you guys can follow along a little bit easier. All right, so this slope will connect to this portal. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take these textures. No, did I say do that? I don't think I said do that. So we're just going to right click, say sat map, connect this texture to the sat map. And we'll look at colors later. And then we're going to do the same thing with this. Connect that one to the sat map. And there we 
we go. So we have two of the same colors here, but we're going to come back to these later. Let's throw in a mixer. Connect those two up. Just clean these up a bit. Get them nice and straight with each other. And then what we're going to do is we're going to connect this mask oops, to this portal. And what that portal does is it's going to connect to this slope. So now if we were to go through and change one of these, it should color based on that slope. So let's go ahead and make sure that we actually have a decent selection, which we do, but I'm going to increase this to 60. It's usually my default go-to number when I'm texturing, just for testing purposes. Um, and then for some reason, if these are not connected, that's happened in the past before, delete the link, take it, and just take it from that node to that node, or portal, and when it turns blue, should be linked. Now it should texture. <laughs> there we go. It's just being a little bit picky. All right, so now let's connect it. There we go. So we have this, this, and now we are blending at 100% those two based on this slope selection. That's where that mask comes in. So hopefully that makes sense. I hope I explained that well enough for all of you. So let's go ahead and continue. I'm just going to clean up some space here for these because these are going to be our mask selections. These are going to be our colors right here. And we're just going to add a bunch of portals. All right. So first, let's change this around so we get a more interesting color selection. So I actually kind of like this one quite a bit. Um, I'm going to change the texture node here to be a different seed. So we, we just have something slightly different than the actual first texture. That way we're not kind of, you know, we have different textures going on all over the place rather than, you know, in the same areas. As you can see here, it kind of changes the seed around. So we, I, I kind of like that. So let's choose something a little bit more interesting here. And we might come back to this if we need something more rocky, but let's see what else we can find. We can try another grass and see how that blends together. That actually blends pretty well. Or we can do like a sand color. We have like this orange that's in the, this tan orange that's already in there. We just have more of that. So now this is what we have. And I think we'll come back to this uh, later. Let's just continue uh, looking around with some uh, different data sets that we can use to texture our landscape. All right, so another thing that we can do is um, we can throw out some data maps. So let's do, before we do a data map, let's do a curvature. This is a really good one to use. We'll just connect that to the erosion node. And we're gonna just throw out a portal. And we're just gonna keep adding portals for every set that we do. That way, I think that didn't link properly. Maybe it did. That way, we uh, can keep things nice and clean. All right, so what curvature is going to do is it's going to select like the convex areas, I guess. Uh, maybe not convex, but like the like I, it's similar to like what I would think of as convexity in World Machine. I could be completely wrong on that, um, but it gives you a nice little data selection here that you can use for texturing or even um, like lighting or uh, texture creation for maybe glossiness or specular maps, things like that. Um, but it works really well for texturing too. So if we take this curvature, connect it to the portal, which we already did and then add in a, um, we can do like a sat map if we wanted, uh, or we can add another texture if we wanted. So let's, let's try adding another texture. That way we kind of just break apart the curvature a bit. 
Let's see what that looks like. It's always nice to experiment. Okay, so that's too much. We're going to come back to this anyways, because we're going to be doing a selection, the, a curvature selection based on slope. But for now, let's just go ahead and add a sat map. <clears throat> okay. And now you can see what's happening here. That set map is being colored based on our curvature right here. If you look in these wider areas, you can see where we have this light sand color coming in. But what we want to do is we actually want to select a color that is not necessarily the same as this color, but close to. So if this one is number 114, so let's take a look at somewhere around that range, 114. Usually there's colors similar to each other in a succession. So 114, looks like 115 and 110 actually look pretty good, but maybe 119 might be better. So let's go ahead and add another mix. I'm just gonna keep these all lined up with each other. Add that to input two, and then add the mask to the portal. Then we have this, and then we have this. And what that's doing, it's very subtle, but what it's doing is it's adding another layer of color data uh, to the curvature of our uh, landscape. But we need to increase the blend amount. And that might blend this color, might be too similar to this, which it is pretty similar. So let's take a moment to change this around. So let's do a dark color and this one will do like a greener color. There we go. So now we have like this rock and grass look. And then right here, you can see where the curvature is being added in our landscape. Right here. So we can change this to something that will blend a little bit better with this, but still stand out. So dark, but maybe light. So like that maybe. You can see how we're getting these little lighter flecks coming in. And those look better at higher resolution. And then the more you add um, different details to each other, the more it starts looking like natural rock rather than just a flat color, which is what we're going for. OK, so let's change this one more time to something a little bit different. Let's see, this one is number 113. So let's go to 113 and 113 and 109 look pretty good. Yeah, I think that works pretty well. As you can see here, we're adding in that additional detail to our color, but it looks like it blends well enough that it's not going to stand out too much. And then this other color, this like grass and dirt color that we have going on uh, blends in pretty well. And we're going to come back and add more to this as we continue. All right, so what we're doing here is we're just thinking small details, building up on these small details, and just adding them, adding them in through masks. That's all we're doing. All right. <clears throat> Let's keep adding some stuff here. So we got the curvature in there, and uh, we're going to add another one later on, I believe, uh, just because I want to add it based on the slope to get bring in a little bit more detail. If you look at the curvature here, we actually didn't change any of the features here. We can choose vertical if we wanted, and that will give us an entirely different look. And that's what we're going to come back and do a little bit down the road, but not right now. All right, so let's add the next favorite data map, which is protrusion. These data maps are really nice for coloring your environment. Um, and that, I don't think that's their main purpose. I could be wrong, but I think they're supposed to be used to kind of help drive different things outside of Gaia, but they're really good for texturing. So let's go ahead and add a portal, and we'll just keep adding these portals until we're done. And if I am doing this weird, for if there's like one portal can drive multiple like outputs, then please let me know because that would be new to me. I, I'm under the assumption that you can only really do one 
per portal, but I still think it's nicer because I don't have to have these lines going back and forth. All right, so we have this protrusion map. So um, let's go ahead and add another sat map. So we're just going to copy this one, connect it. And then again, we're just going to add another mixer. And we're just going to keep doing this until we get the results we want. It's a fairly easy way of texturing. All right. But we do need to change our color here. We are bringing in the protrusion a bit. So if we go back and look at this one, you can see how we're bringing in these other features. But we don't want them to be totally similar to this. We want them to stand out just a tad bit from the rest. So we're just going to this brown rock might be a good rusty look, but it's not exactly what I'm looking for. And we can use even a lighter color if we wanted, like that. That's probably too much. It just is like play. You just play with it a little bit till you find what you want. Or you can make your own. I mean, you can use clutter instead. Clutter is really good. I know I haven't used it a whole lot, but it is pretty good. So that one breaks up the rock even more, adds this cool uh, protrusion effect to our landscape. So here it is without, here it is with, but I think we're losing too much of that underlying rock with this one. So let's just keep looking. So we have that one, now we have this one. This one makes it look more like a old rock with crusty um, like convector noise on, or erosion on top of it. Looks pretty nice, actually. And you don't have to use blend always. You can use you know, whatever looks nice. Add usually looks OK for some purposes, but not always. Uh, screen is a good way to go, too. Uh, screen will take on the underlying effects of your landscape a little bit better than blend. So if you have details on your color map that you don't want to lose, but you want the data to be there, like the color data, you can use screen. Or you can do what I normally do, uh, where I use uh, max, which is pretty good. And you can play around with the max ratio a bit more to bring in the uh, color as much as you want. Or you can be creative and say, well, this is white or like a lighter color, and I want this to be darker, but I'm just not getting it. You can throw in some other nodes in here to play with it, or you can just use subtract. That's always a good way to go. So now we have like these darker burnt areas on the landscape. But in this case, I really like max, and I'm just going to tone down the amount we have going on here by about 50%. There we go. So that's what we had after or before. So this is our first one. And so far, all we're really working on is the rock. We're not working on much of anything else. That's what we had with the second layer. And this is what we have with the third layer. And now we're getting more of these rocky looks coming in. Now, this is a good point to save it. And I already made one before that I actually posted on the ch on the Facebook page, which is that peak one. I'll do this one as peak two. And we're going to build this out at 1K to see what it looks like at a slightly higher resolution. All right. So at 1K, that looks pretty good. We've got a lot of detail coming in on this uh, color map that we're making. And the rocks are looking pretty good, too. We have nice rocky detail coming in. Um, all right, so let's continue adding. Uh, we can do this all day. I mean, we can use as many maps, data maps, selections, anything. We can use as many as we want to get the detail we want. And don't just look at one area like we have been kind of. Look at your entire landscape while you're building. Look at like down here, you can see we have like these um, taluses that are kind of being created here. And then we have this nice rock face coming in. And you have to think of this as building your procedural texture. So 
in our case the landscape itself is just a very basic eroded landscape with some kind of interesting features in it like down here we have like these um, terraces down here uh, and we have like this cool rock cliff face right here kind of like it's being jutted out of the the earth but you want to have a very good base landscape before you do any kind of texturing otherwise uh, your textures no matter how much you effort you put into them they're just not going to look great so make sure you build a nice landscape first and then focus on your textures last i always suggest taking more time to build your landscape um, and then you know maybe taking as much time or less time building your textures so anyways let's keep going this is looking pretty good now we're going to go ahead and add another selection but this is going to be based on slope again so we're just going to copy this slope node I'm just gonna set it there I guess and this one we're gonna go ahead and select all of the steep areas so anything from about 90 degrees to about 82 maybe maybe even uh, 85 might be good yeah I think that'll do good and then we just want to take down the fall off a bit maybe not that much okay that I think that'll do all right and then what we're gonna do is we're also going to use a curvature but we're going to connect the curvature here and then we're gonna connect this slope to the mask of the curvature so now we are selecting the curvature based on our mask selection right here with the slope I'm just gonna set these up a little bit better there we go so that's our slope selection here's our curvature selection based on that slope and then we're going to change that to vertical and I, th I don't think we're going to change much of anything else here I think we can probably invert it but that's not going to change it much from our slope selection and I only want very little bits being selected here you can change the min, min and max and then the fall off here if you wanted I'm just gonna keep it like this just for expediency let's go ahead and add a portal and connect these two portals together and let's do a sat map there we go just to clean it up a bit and it's wanting to die again as per any beta program all right or you know mostly beta maybe not even mostly sorry Dex anyways uh, that's what we have there so let's go ahead and use this same one right here but see how we're gonna get these details in there we need to add another mixer I'm just gonna copy that one let's connect all it all connect it all up there we go now that's what we have after now we've added this dusting on there but we can use maybe max on this one just to bring it out a bit more or we can even just go straight back to using blend which you know doesn't really change it much in this case because it's blending in very small amounts of details in there uh, and again you know you can play with it see what you like maybe using subtract giving it this burnt feeling might be better it just comes down to uh, your artistic tastes I suppose I like max but maybe not at a hundred <laughs> 69 <laughs> 70 might do well so that is before this is after we've just kind of built up this rock layer upon layer upon layer giving it all these little details rather than having this flat base color going across the entire thing all right so that looks cool um, looks good for our purposes all right so let's go ahead and add some additional details on these uh, floor areas the ground areas 
Uh, and there's not a whole lot of detail here going on. We just have like this mountain jutting up out of the middle, uh, which is fine for visualizing and practicing, which is what I mostly do. Uh, but we want to be able to add details in here at the bottom. So we can do it by either adding together, mixing together multiple texture maps and just using different s selections based on slope or height. Or we could do it based on, um, uh, let's see here, one of these data maps. So we can use velocity, which is usually a pretty good one. Uh, but that one you really have to ring in. So I think what we're going to do is we're just going to use a slope and height selection. So let's go ahead and do another slope selection. And uh, we'll select really low values here. So very minimum. And we'll go to about 15. There we go. So we're going to be selecting mostly everything on the floor and up into these little valley areas on the landscape. And then we're also going to do a height selection on that as well. We don't need to do uh, we don't need to select everything on the entire landscape at that slope angle. We just need to do it at the lower elevations. So I'm just going to add a height node. Height node. Let's connect it to the slope, and we're just going to select the very bottom areas. It's about that's one percent. Holy crazy! And realize the elevation on this thing is wicked small. All right, there we go. Now we're not ha we don't have any selection here on the slope. We just have it down here. All right, let's go ahead and add our portals. Oops. That's going to want to crash. There we go. Okay. Now we can add some other stuff here. Um, if we wanted to, we could also maybe throw in another noise here to break it up. So instead of that portal being right there, it's going to crash again. We can add like a noise. So let's do like a purlin noise. Add that to the mask here. I'm going to add that to the output. And that's going to be the one lone portal that doesn't have a home with the line of other portals. And uh, we can display this as a 2D map. And what this is doing is it's adding all these variations down here in the floor area. So if we just had the slope, this is all we would have is this plain white. And that's no bueno. We need to break that up a bit so we get some variation. So adding this purlin in here, it adds some variation, but only in those areas that we've selected. So we can turn the scale down and make it really small like this, so we can get a lot of variation. And we can turn the octaves down so we have variation, but it's not like intense. It's very smooth and flat. We can increase it and get a lot of variation depending on you know our needs. So let's just change the seed, and I think we'll keep that for now. Now let's just see what it looks like with the sat map. We'll just hop straight into it. Looks kind of interesting-ish. So let's hit F on here. Nope. Yeah, F, pin. And then we'll just change this purlin around to see if it changes any of this, which it does. So I'm thinking maybe a higher scale. 
instead or if we even turn it way down but increase the octaves a bit more maybe turn the warping off there we go we can also change like the noise types depending on what we need it's like billowy rigid billowy looks pretty interesting these are interesting colors I mean we're gonna change the sat map but we might not be getting what we need here because there's just not enough other information there it's still really flat and just breaking apart the selection itself based on this noise isn't really gonna cut it so if we can't find what we need here and you can see how we can get some really cool looking like rock effect here though uh, then we might need to just change this around uh, we can break it up with a texture node so let's go ahead and add that there and then we'll also use it as the mask there for the selection the slope selection and let's see what we get with that it might not do anything again I mean this selecting the floor area and coloring that based on certain things is still relatively new to me I haven't really done that a whole lot I've always just always had different uh, noises down here that were easily colored and selected and whatnot so there's that for you um, yes I think that'll do let's change this Perlin back to FBM that texture node really cut it out a bit added more interesting features and broke apart the like circular patterns we were getting which is really nice and it also takes a long time to build texture so just keep that in mind we're still bu building out at 1k though all right it's done building that's what we have all right so I think we want that green color that we had oh we still have it pinned there we go this one right here and this one is 112 so if we were to change this one to 112 what would we get it would blend in fairly well with what we already had there but also give us different pattern variation so that's what we had before so let's go ahead and add another mixer add the mask to there and increase the blend it's breaking up the pattern that we had down there but I think it's breaking it up in too big a pattern too big a like patches right there so let's find another greenish one that gives us more breakup like that one maybe so that was before this is after and now we have grass areas and then like this probably dry or dead grassy areas but we also kept our sand and dirt and trees and rock all that fun stuff we kept all of it uh, and we didn't have to destroy these other really cool patterns that we had like these uh, swirly patterns down here that you would get in like sand when there's runoff and things like that or like right here where there could have been like a dry riverbed or maybe down here and this was a lake that dried up or you know whatever your imagination is uh, I mean your, your imagination is the limit on it all right so, so we have our texture and we can keep going we don't have to stop and we can keep adding and adding and adding until our hearts content or until we run out of memory or you get lose out of patience or whatever but in any case this is all it took I know it took a long time to explain that but it took longer to set up than it probably did to explain it so this will probably conclude the more advanced texturing tutorial I really like the way this texture map looks from the top down 
I like how the rock looks, how the dust looks, all that fun stuff looks pretty slick. So um, if you have any questions or concerns, please get a hold of me at www.pwndesign.com or on the Facebook page, whichever floats your boat. And if you want to see me put together a little bit more uh, of these videos for training and learning purposes, please let me know and I will do that for you. I'm going to go ahead and build this out at a higher resolution, throw it into Octane, and uh, we're going to see if we can get it to look you know, pretty decent. I think it looks pretty good, just colored like this already. And one more thing, uh, I know I mentioned it before and I mentioned it in the other video as well, but you have to consider this part in Gaia, this whole texturing part, as your procedural texturing that you would do in any other program. If you have a good looking terrain, and you really rein in your textures a bit more, add you know layer upon layer and detail upon detail, you shouldn't have to really rely on third-party applications to get you the color data you need. You could probably use different displacements, normal maps and bump maps to get other details in areas that you need it, um, but you shouldn't have to really rely on those all that much if you are building these out at high enough resolutions and adding the detail where they belong um, or how they should look. And you can do that totally inside of Gaia. It just takes a little bit of patience, a little bit of time, and a little bit of know-how, and you should be good. That's how I do all of my textures. The only thing I really add after I export anything is a bump map, but the bump map is a noise generated by Octane in C40. So it's procedural. I don't have to worry about it mapping in some weird way. And I can usually rein in the details as much as I want. So anyways, I'm going to go ahead and build these out at a higher resolution. And I'm going to throw them in the Octane. I'll probably do like a quick like speed run time lapse of it. Anyways, thank you.